Perfect timing, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Uh, this committee uh, will come to order. Uh, I certainly like to welcome my fellow members um, as well as our witnesses and guests to this first hearing of our subcommittee on government organization, efficiency, and financial management. Uh, I certainly am honored, uh, Mr. Chairman, to be working with you again. And uh, uh, for those who don't know, uh, when I was last in the majority and had the privilege of chairing this subcommittee, uh, Mr. Towns was my ranking member for those four years. And when uh, he went into the majority. I got to be his ranking member. Uh, so we're playing musical chairs here, but uh, the same commitment of working together for just good government issues. So uh, again, I'm delighted to be uh, reunited with you. Um, I'm going to uh, offer an abbreviated open statement because we appreciate our witnesses' patience in, uh, in uh, holding, uh, holding down the fort here while we finished up votes on the floor. Um, but we're anxious to get your testimony. Um, our focus here today is um, really to uh, look at a specific issue, financial information of the federal government, and particularly how that information is reported and, and then acted upon, and specifically the consolidated financial report and how we can make it more useful. Uh, the question we're asking is um, how we take that information and make it more useful, not just to Congress, but to the American people. And certainly given the uh, deficit uh, spending that we uh, see year in and year out and a $14 trillion debt, uh, we know the American people care deeply about this issue, about how we're handling their money uh, responsibly or not. Uh, I want to certainly applaud the Federal Accounting Standards Advisory Board for taking a very important first step uh, in convening a task force to look at the fe federal financial reporting model and uh, how we can uh, improve that model and make it more beneficial to, uh, again, the public as well as members of Congress. Delighted to have um, Three uh, wonderful witness here, witnesses here today. Uh, first, Mr. Tom Allen, chairman of uh, FASAB. Uh, I understand this is the first time that FASAB has been invited to uh, testify before Congress. Uh, we're glad to have you here. Uh, Mr. Jonathan Brule, executive director of the IBM Center for Business of, the Business of Government. Uh, and we're pleased to uh, have you testifying before the subcommittee again. Uh, Mr. Townsend, I certainly benefited from your expertise in the 108th and 109th sessions of Congress and know we will again be uh, benefit and blessed by your, uh, your in information and your expertise. And finally, Mr. Mike Hettinger, Executive Director uh, with Grant Thornton. Uh, it's uh, really uh, great to see you here on the other side of the table. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Mike was uh, uh, our subcommittee staff director for four years and did an outstanding job and uh, as well as other positions here on the Hill and uh, kind of brings perspective of both uh, a staff person as well as now in the private sector. Uh, as we speak, the Government Accountability Office is releasing its biannual high risk list. Many issues identified by GAO have to do with sound financial management, uh, more likely a lack thereof. Though this may seem somewhat dry, some of the topics our subcommittee will deal with, it is incredibly important. And nothing is more important than being effective stewards of the taxpayers' funds, particularly in difficult financial times as we see facing our nation today. Uh, this hearing will set the stage for our agenda over the coming two years, and it will especially provide us an opportunity as subcommittee members uh, to prepare for our next hearing when we will have Treasury, OMB, and GAO before us to testify about the consolidated financial reports. And what we hope to glean from you is uh, ideas we can share with those witnesses in a few weeks and get their input uh, on your recommendations of how we can make the information more valuable and useful to all parties. Uh, that hearing will be on March 9th. Uh, with that, I'm going to submit the rest of my record, uh, statement for the record and uh, yield to Mr. Towns uh, if you'd like to make an and opening Mr. statement. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to place my statement in the record to uh, be made and I will assist the witness. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, all members will have seven days to submit uh, written statements for the record. Uh, we'll now go to uh, our witnesses. The policy of the subcommittee to always swear in our witnesses. If I could ask you to stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Okay. Thank you. I uh, appreciate your affirmation. And uh, we'll begin, Mr. Allen, with your testimony. Again, thanks for your uh, presence here and sharing your expertise. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Congressman Towns. 
I appreciate the opportunity to testify today. I want to convey five key messages in my comments. The first of those is that citizens want to receive directly information about their government's finances. The second of those is that accrual-based financial statements do contain information that is a good indication of the current financial health of the government and of future financial health. The third issue is the key. The Federal Government is such a complex and large organization that it is challenging to convey its financial information in an easily understood manner. The fourth key point is that Internet tools can help in overcoming these challenges, and the other witnesses will talk about that. Number five, the task force developed a series of recommendations that will be considered in the coming months by FASAB and others to better to improve Federal financial reporting. Exceptional work has gone into improving Federal financial reporting since the passage of the Chief Financial Officers Act in 1990. The Federal Accounting Standards Advisory Board, FASAB, plays a key role by providing generally accepted accounting principles referred to as GAAP standards and has been recognized by the accounting profession as meeting the criteria necessary for a standard-setting body. Accrual-based financial reporting standards issued by FASAB call for recognizing commitments and obligations as they occur rather than when cash may flow in or out of the Federal Government. This, is, this same measure applies to all companies or organizations in the United States that have audited financial statements. Since the Federal Government has for a number of years prepared accrual-based financial statements, I decided to look back 10 years to fiscal 2000 to see if accrual-based information was helpful in better understanding the financial condition of the government at that time and to see if that financial information was of predictive value in looking forward. As you know, fiscal 2000 was, is remembered as the last of the great surplus uh, years with a $237 billion budget surplus. And fiscal 2000 was a very positive year when compared to more recent fiscal years. However, information gleaned from the financial statements and the disclosures indicated that even though there were ca cash surpluses in the years from 2008 to 2010, the debt subject to the debt limit actually increased by $152 billion during that time. This increase is attributable to the intergovernmental, intragovernmental debt, which is issued when Social Security and other trust fund dedicated credits are not needed to pay benefits for that period and are loaned to the government. The real financial stress from the, for the government would come in future years as those intergovernment borrowings needed to be repaid. To discover when repayment may be necessary, I looked further. I looked at the financial statements, and uh, back on page 56, I found stewardship information talking about the present value of long-term actuarial projections, called actuarial deficits. It was $13 trillion in the year, fiscal year 2000, and increasing by an average of 2 to $3 trillion each of those years. This amount, these amounts are not reflected in the balance sheet or operating statement of the Federal Government, but they do impact the financial condition of the Federal Government. The financial statements in 2000 included the message from then Comptroller David Walker noting the unsustainability of those programs and the need to reform them at the earliest opportunity. These comments are not to imply any inappropriateness of the above stated transactions or noncompliance with Federal GRAP but rather to note that there was information to help financial statement readers better understand the broad financial condition of the government at that time, including fiscal challenges that would need to be dealt with in the future. However, citizens and other readers would probably have difficulty in understanding these transactions and what the numbers in those financial statements represented. Despite the much progress that has been made, FASAB has recognized the difficulty of communicating often complex Federal financial information and the need to improve the understandability of Federal financial reporting. The question of how to better communicate this financial information has also been a challenge. 
Accordingly, the Federal Reporting Model Project was added to the FACEAB agenda. Beginning in the year 2008, we undertook a user study. We found that citizens do want to know about more about the financial health of the Federal Government, but they did often did not know that financial statements even existed and, when shown the financial statements, had un trouble understanding what they meant. Our sponsors from Treasury, OMB, and GAO are also seeking to better inform citizens regarding the financial condition of the Federal Government. Their efforts have resulted in the schedules of key amounts in the financial statement management discussion and analysis. These schedules are illustrated in my written comments. For fiscal year 2000, additional long-term projections have been added to the financial report. These long-term projections help inform readers about the challenge of, continued, of continuing current financial policy without change. The task force provided a list of 10 recommendations for consideration by FASAB and its sponsors. I want to thank them for the expertise they brought together and their excellent recommendations. I am hopeful that these recommendations and our e other efforts will lead to a better informed citizenry. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Mr. Burrell. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Towns. I am pleased to have the opportunity to, to testify this afternoon regarding the report of the FASAB Financial Reporting Task Force. Um, late last year, the government released its annual financial report. And although that report presents information that is important to citizens as they form judgments about the fiscal future of the government under current policy, it is unlikely that Americans are even aware of its existence or its availability. And because the Nation is currently engaged in crucial debates about the appropriate role in the near term and the long term fiscal imbalance, the annual financial report is now more relevant than ever before to citizens political leaders and analysts. Further, the recent celebration of the 20th anniversary of the Chief Financial Officers Act offers a clear reminder of the considerable improvement in financial reporting over the past two decades. However, the challenge of effectively delivering that information to users remains unfinished. I served as a member of the FASAB task force. The objective of that task force was to increase users' access, their understanding, and their use of financial information while avoiding costly requirements that do not add value. To do so, the task force focused on the consolidated financial report, largely because that is where we judged the public would start in order to learn about the fiscal health of the Federal Government as a whole. And the FASAB user studies, as Mr. Allen indicated, showed that citizens and indeed many executives and managers in government have difficulty understanding the information in that report. Indeed, many of them believe the document is written by accountants or economists, uh, which it is. And consequently, they believe the government should adopt a web based method of communicating information about the fiscal condition and performance of the Federal Government. Since four of the task force's recommendations a focus on methods to enhance the, this communication of government-wide financial information, I want to devote the balance of my remarks just to highlighting those four items. The first task force recommendation was to move away from paper-based reporting and to adopt an electronic, web-based reporting method. The public relies increasingly on digital devices, whether it is Blackberries and other devices which we all are carrying, and interactive media to obtain their information on demand. Um, accordingly, financial reporting information needs to switch from a paper-based static reporting model to more electronic, dynamic, and readily available online uh, availability. The task force's second recommendation urged FASAB to explore how to best report additional government-wide program performance in the management discussion and analysis, or MD&A section of the consolidated report, or in other electronic government-wide presentations. The Nation's engaged in deliberations uh, to determine the Federal Government's future role in the economy and society and program performance measures presented in the consolidated report could potentially help inform that debate, especially if they were structured to provide such information 
um, about the government's effectiveness in achieving its plan goals, as well as the economy and efficiency of government operations. And I should point out that this recommendation now very nicely aligns with the recently enacted GPRA Modernization Act, which is, you know, strengthens the existing requirements for the reporting of performance information and calls upon the Office of Management and Budget to develop a government-wide performance plan. The third recommendation of the task force is to present net costs and spending by function. The current statement of net costs is presented by agency. FASAB focus group discussions with citizens indicated that users are much more likely to focus on the government's functions, such as health care, social services, national security, those kind of functions rather than the agencies which are administering them. And as you know, that's the kind of information which the budget is currently presented, and it's a breakdown which many in Congress and the federal government are already familiar and use on a regular basis. The task force's final recommendation was to establish a central website for f federal financial information and to aggressively inform the public of its availability. Ultimately, the success of the previous recommendations requires uh, making the public aware of these financial reports and the information they provide. A central website would enable the federal government to take advantage of existing technology and to help identify improvements that may be needed. The static paper-based reports that the federal government delivers today contain important information about the fiscal health of the federal government. However, those reports are not presented or available in a way that makes them easy to use or easy to understand, thereby limiting their impact. The government needs to use modern technology to inform the presentation of that information and adapt to the way users want to receive the information and are much more likely to use that information. Thank you. Mr. Hettinger. Chairman Platts, Ranking Member Towns, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Um, as you mentioned in your opening remarks, I served from 2003 to 2006 as the staff director of this subcommittee. Uh, I'm currently an executive director with Grant Thornton's Global Public Sector Practice, but I'm here as a witness today based on my experience serving as a member of the Financial Reporting Model Task Force to the FASAB. I applaud the committee for holding this hearing today and for your ongoing interest in government efficiency and effectiveness. Since the enactment of the CFO Act in 1990, we have seen a steady and significant improvement in the quality and availability of information about the federal government's finances. That information contained in individual agency financial statements performance and accountability reports, the consolidated financial report, and other reports provides a sound baseline for decision makers and citizens alike to better understand how the federal government is using their hard-earned tax dollars. The issuance of the CFR in mid-December each year should set off a chain of events where Congress, the administration, and the general public have an opportunity to look at the financial condition of the government prior to the issuance of the President's budget. All too often, however, the issuance of the CFO, CFR goes largely unnoticed. About six years ago, when I worked on this subcommittee, I participated in an effort led by the Department of Treasury to improve the usefulness of the CFR. That effort, among other things, led to the development of the Citizen's Guide to the Financial Report of the U.S. Government. This document provides an effective high-level summary of the highlights of that year's CFR, useful for citizens seeking a basic understanding but not necessarily useful for Congress or other decision makers. Last spring, FASAP conducted a user needs study to assess the financial information needs of the Congress. This study follows a mid 1980s study by GAO. The GAO Federal Government Reporting Study conducted in 1986 found with respect to legislators that Congress needed specialized agency information uh, for the conducting of committee business but summary level information for use in communicating with constituents, providing a means for the federal government to demonstrate its accountability. The spring 2010 FASAP study confirmed many of these same 
needs are applicable today and fall into four broad categories, budgetary integrity, operating performance, stewardship, and systems and control. From my experience, these broad categories accurately reflect the information needs of Congress. Members and staff attain this information from a variety of sources, including the news media, agencies directly, legislative support organizations, such as CRS, inspectors general, or via your own research and oversight. There is also a wealth of information contained in statutorily required reports, including the CFR, as well as, as agency PARs, and I believe Congress and the general public would benefit greatly from making that information more readily available and understandable. With the creation of websites like usaspending.gov, data.gov, the federal procurement data system, and private websites looking at the financial condition of the government, citizens now have access to more information than ever before and clearly more interest in the information contained in those sites. Ease of use and the relevance of the information housed on these sites drives visitors. However, the completeness and accuracy of the data contained within is essential for those government-owned sites. The mission of the Financial Reporting Model Task Force, as, as Jonathan mentioned in his statement, to increase users' access to and understanding and use of financial information in the CFR while avoiding costly requirements that don't add value sought to address this very issue. I was pleased to be a part of this effort because I believe that mission gets to the heart of where we stand on federal financial management 20 years after the enactment of the CFO Act. We have a great deal of information, but that information is not understandable by the general public or useful for decision makers. The task force, as Jonathan also mentioned, makes 10 key recommendations ranging from adopting a web-based reporting model to presenting a functional statement of net cost to establishing federal a federal financial information website and raising awareness of federal the availability of federal financial information. Recommendation one, asking Treasury to move away from a paper-based reporting model by an adopting an electronic web-based reporting model is essential if we are to move in the direction of improving the availability and transparency of government information. This recommendation combined with recommendation 10, which calls for the establishment of a federal financial information website to help raise awareness of the government's financial information go a long way toward improving the ease of access to information. Um, recommendation three regarding a functional statement of net cost would present net cost and spending by function, as Jonathan mentioned, uh, such as health care rather than by agencies such as HHS. Uh, this recommendation, I believe, is essential if we are to truly understand the cost of government. Uh, and there are a number of other recommendations that I've highlighted in my uh, in my written statement. I'll skip over those uh, because I think they've been addressed by the other witnesses. Uh, I'll close by saying there's a, a wealth of really important financial information contained in the CFR uh, as well as in agency financial statements. But to make that information relevant, it must be timely, accurate, understandable, and usable. Uh, thank you again for the opportunity to, to be here today and I'm happy to answer any questions the members may have. Thank you again for uh, testimony, all three, and your written statements will be made part of the uh, record as well. Uh, delighted to have been joined by one of our freshman members, uh, Congressman Gosar from Arizona. Delighted to have you with us on the committee and, and a returning uh, senior member, uh, Mr. Cooper from Tennessee. So thanks for uh, both of you being with us. We're going to do um, a round of questions in, in basically five minutes and, and rotate, and then if we have uh, need for a second, third, fourth round, we'll, we'll come back around. But um, Mr. Allen, I, I'd like to start um, in your role with FACEHAB. You certainly, in setting accounting standards for the federal government, you have to kind of please a lot of different communities. Uh, you know, the uh, bond uh, rating agencies, auditors, citizens, members of Congress, federal managers. Um, when we talk about uh, some of the recommendations that the task force has made and uh, going to a web-based reporting model for uh, financial statements, going to that model seems kind of mutually beneficial to all communities, uh, whether it be members of Congress or the public at large. But um, is, is it different when we talk about how or how the information that's on that web-based uh, model is re, uh, reported? Is there a difference in what's going to be useful to the public at large versus how it needs to be presented for members of Congress or other policymakers within the federal government? Are they mutually exclusive in how the information is uh, presented within the uh, the web model. 
Clearly, as you indicated, the needs of somebody who is managing an agency are probably very specific. They have to be very timely, in fact, real time. They can't wait till after the end of the year to prepare financial statements. So I think the recommendations are very positive in terms of an electronic uh, database that allows you to actually drill down and access the level of detail that you want. There are challenges of getting it real time for some people and others who would look at it at the end of the year and say, okay, here's a broad overview. But the efficiencies that need to take place in the federal government that I think would be significant is if we had the same financial systems that provided the information to manage were also the same financial systems that were used to generate the numbers that would prepare the financial statements after the end of the year and would have audit coverage. That gives credibility to everyone who is using that system. The challenge right now is often that is not the case in yep. agencies. And so that is one of the things that I would encourage you and your committee to encourage and look forward to. But yes, the technology and the drill down capacity would be beneficial. Um, and, and what you envision when you talk about the drill down uh, opportunities is you have the CFR and kind of the overall report, but if it is a web based model, then you can link through that web based model down into NASA or DOD or Commerce and get into the nitty gritty of that individual department or agency's financials uh, pretty easily. And even, even beyond what they are now reporting, because what we heard from citizens, uh, for example, everyone was interested in the cost of defense. But what they were interested in is a lot lower detail than anything that is reported now. They wanted to know the cost of a war in a particular country or something like that. So uh, I think as we gather the data electronically, now obviously there is going to be some work in sort of how you uh, cut and dice that information, but you would clearly be able to answer the detail questions people want. Not too many people say, just tell me the total cost of defense and I am happy to know that. Is it fair to say that what your uh, FASAB and the task force recommendations are about is and we already have right to know laws and we have a right to know the, ac uh, the information, but it is getting access to it in a usable, time sensitive manner is that your recommendation are is, is not uh, changing the right to know, but the access to what you do have a right to know right. uh, and through a, a, a better resource uh, tool such as a web-based model. Yes, that is a very good summary. Thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Hett Hettinger and Mr. Brohl, when you, uh, when the task force looked at, you know, and made your recommendations, um, what was the, in, in maybe the most significant limitation in the way we're doing it now, uh, and was it lack of data, or how we're presenting the data, uh, you know, or just the public's lack of knowledge that the data is out there for them to 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 get and use. Is consolidated financial report is not a bestseller. Yeah. Um, you couldn't go to the local bookstore and find one. I recall one of our meetings, we looked around and we had a hard time finding one at our meeting. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the problems are pretty basic. They have to do with the availability of that information. And then, second, the presentation, the readability and understanding. Um, it, it, the, the published documents full of spreadsheets. And they're hard printed spreadsheets. They're not searchable. They're not yep. readily understandable. And um, they're not the kind of thing that an average citizen could quickly lay their eyes on and, and understand. It takes some, some attention and some skill. Well, and I, I think that certainly you know, sums up the, the general thoughts on it. Um, in a way, it's almost too much information. And uh, I mean, as Jonathan talked about, if you were to pull one out, and, and I'm guessing no one here has one, um, but if you were to pull one out, it's it's uh, you know it's <laughs> it's this big, and um, it, it's got an awful lot of detailed information in there. And your average citizen is not going to look at that document and, and quite honestly understand uh, much of anything that's in it. Um, what we tried to do as we looked at this electronic reporting model was say, okay, what can we put at a summary level? that citizens will use, but then those who are decision makers and others will be able to drill down deeper and find uh, the, the type of information they need. I think that's what's interesting about the, uh, 
both the Treasury effort I mentioned from five or six years ago as well as the user needs study because there is a balance. I mean, one of the things we learned in that Treasury effort is the bond rating agencies, Moody's and Standard and & Poor's and those folks are actually very interested in the detailed data that is contained in the Consolidated Financial Report. Your average citizen doesn't want to see the same type of information that, um, that Moody's and Standard and & Poor's want to see. So uh, we try to provide a, a, a vehicle that will allow for some summary level information but then a drill down um, that won't overwhelm people. When, um, before I yield to uh, the rank member, I think that what we've seen um, over the years, and Mr. Cooper certainly uh, has been a leader in trying to raise awareness within the, the public at large of the importance of these issues. And uh, as Mr. Burrell said, you know, it's not necessarily a bestseller, uh, the, the CFR, but uh, it is really one of the most critical reports that's done for the American people when it comes to how we're spending their money. And uh, I've joked in the past uh, when I last chaired the subcommittee that um, in getting attention to this issue of, of the information and, and access to the information is uh, I've gotten to the point where I think that maybe we need to, along with the three of you experts, is to have a, you know, maybe a baseball player who's doing steroids be here you know, to uh, show an interest in uh, the consolidated financial reports. And that would help generate interest in, in this very important information. So. Um, you know, we're, we're going to keep trying to raise awareness and, uh, and, and work with you and others on uh, better access to this critically important information. So with that, I yield to the uh, ranking member, Mr. Towns. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, well, when you get that baseball player, just make certain he's not a Yankee. <laughs> <laughs> well, a as a diehard Orioles fan, no problem there. So. <laughs> yeah. Let me, uh, again, thank you very much for holding this hearing. And let me begin by, you know, we keep talking about the word user, user friendly. You know, uh, what can we do to sort of make this more user friendly so people can sort of understand it in terms of, you know, members of Congress and the general public in, in particular? Um, what can we do? You have any ideas of some things that we might be able to do to make it a little more user friendly? Yes, right. Uh, I'll I'll get, oh, go ahead. I'll, I'll throw out a couple ideas. I, I mean, obviously, um, as Jonathan mentioned in his, um, in his prepared testimony, um, people get information quicker. They get information electronically primarily. I mean, you, uh, you know, it, it's, it's one of these things. In, in this age, age, the information comes so much quicker. So I think recognizing that information comes in different forms. Uh, in the, the government, FASAB, um, and, and some of the recommendations in the task force, but primarily the Department of Treasury who issues a report, need to recognize the different ways that people get information. Um, and that moves you in a lot of different in, in a lot of different ways. And the recommendations, I think, to go to an electronic reporting model reflect that. Um, you know, it, it's important to recognize um, this is not information uh, contained in the Consolidated Financial Report that everyone has an interest in. And you look at USA Spending and some of the other websites that are out there, there's very specific information to congressional districts and, and um, spending that goes on in those congressional districts. And I personally believe a lot of the information and the reason people are driven to those, those sites is because they want to see how much money how much of their ta tax dollars are getting returned to their own congressional districts. The information in here is a, a little bit different. Um, so you're not, not everyone's going to have an interest in it, but, um, but if you get it out there electronically, usable, findable, if it pops up on Google when you do a search for the, for the Federal Financial Report or U.S. Government Financial Report, uh, folks are going to start to pay more attention. Let me offer two quick suggestions. One is to use many more charts and graphs and, and colorful displays. Uh, the document right now has many spreadsheets and tables, as you might expect, but um, USA Today, the newspapers, uh, you read the front page of the paper today, bars and charts and graphs are, are often a, a more effective way of communicating, particularly to citizens. And so use of more use of devices like that 
um, would be helpful. And again, the web-based tools would be helpful in that regard. The, the second, and also in the web-based category, is this idea of having it machine readable. Um, right now, that's a hard document in which you've got usually it's called a PDF file, which is a, 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 a true copy of the document uh, reproduced for you in hard form or viewable on the screen. But if it was machine readable data, such as recovery.gov had been in the past for the, the Recovery Act money, you could search by a county or a title or a period of time and come up with the data that particularly corresponded to your particular interest and would make it a, a much more user-friendly and user-customized uh, tool for people to begin to dig in. And I think that's indeed why recovery.gov has been so popular. It's getting millions, hundreds of millions of hits because citizens are able to dig in where the financial statements don't have that ability right now and, and could, could change. Thank you. Okay. Um, I, th I think, uh, Congressman, the one of the challenges is that even people who understand how to read financial statements, when they look at the financial statements of the federal government, it, it is confusing to them. Traditional financial statements have a very clear bottom line, and they have a clear operating statement that shows how much that financial position changed in a period of time. Now, because of the complexities, and it starts with the way things are budgeted, and, and when you look at the financial statements of the federal government, you see I have information on social insurance. It is in a separate financial statement. I have information on long-term projections. That's in a separate financial statement. I, I really don't have a bottom line. If you were to ask me how did we do last year, just like in my testimony, my written comments, if I ask you how did we do in 2007, off the top of your head, you would say great. But in reality, once you start looking at some of the information that I laid out, how great was it? And that's something that you would start asking yourself, you know, in your mind, well, it was great, but we were increasing our debt. Uh, how do those two things reconcile together? So, I mean, that's, that's the challenge that we have with the complexity of the federal government. And that probably would require more than just standards that we would set. That would require a concerted effort of Congress and the way they approach things and the way they budget things and the way it's reported to citizens. So that, that would be a very comprehensive challenge, but would be a challenge worthy to at least look at to get to a understandable bottom line. Uh, Dr. Gosar. Thank you, Thank you very much, gentlemen, for being here today. You know, uh, it's a, it's a two-way street. I think it's also from the legislators to having quick synopsises of what we're actually seeing and being able to convey that to people as well. Um, the nonprofits do this very, very well in some cases where you say for every dollar we put in, how many cents are actually derived to the source that we're, we're trying to adjudicate for. <clears throat> so with that in mind, I think we have to look introspectively. And, and from your perspective, what is the best way from an accounting perspective to determine if a government program is using its dollars efficiently. Do you want to talk about the, the recommendations on uniting the performance information with the financial? Do you want to go ahead and ad address that initially, or was that directed to me? I'll, yeah. just, okay. well, I'll just start it off then. The, the second of the recommendations was to include performance information, that cost alone was not a sufficient perspective. Um, you really needed to know what you got for that money. And again, that's why I mentioned the recent enactment of the GPRA Modernization Act, which is a, a renewed attention by the administration and Congress that, that you need a complete picture of not only what we spend, but what we're getting for that spending and understanding the, the performance and, and, and results that are, that are being paid for with this money during that particular period of time. And to me, that's the essential pairing of information that, that's needed to really make a, an informed judgment of whether we're getting the value that uh, we are expecting. I mean, I, I'll associate myself with, um, with Jonathan's remarks. I, I mean, there's lots of ways to try to understand how a, uh, how a federal program is, is, whether it's achieving its results. 
Um, you know, when I worked on the subcommittee, uh, Chairman Platts and I worked together to uh, to try to promote a bill which um, looks somewhat like what what the uh, the Gipper Modernization Act looked like. It th that bill changed over time. Uh, the intent was to to you know take a programmatic approach to um, to looking at the performance of programs, basically line by line, program by program, uh, building on the Bush administration's you know program assessment rating tool. Uh, you know, I think it's a, it's it's effective. What what you then have to do, as as Jonathan talked about, is to tie that program performance information back to budget, uh, and that's really the key in, in assessing the performance, but then demonstrating um, some budgetary changes as a result of a of a program's performance. Uh, easier said than done in a lot of ways, I think, um, but that's how, that's how I would approach it. That's how I think um, it's been approached, and there have been many as you know, many efforts by Congress and, and others over the years to try to understand exactly how effective these programs are are being. I would add, I guess you, you talked about not-for-profit organizations and even there the standard setter identified what it is you need to report, cost of raising money versus program services you are delivering, but there is no requirement from an accounting standpoint of tell us how effective you are. And so it is a challenge. In fact, that probably is an area that is best addressed by those who are managing those programs, the agencies themselves. And I think from a standard setter standpoint, we can say you should include program information, but how to effectively present it is probably going to reside uh, with those agencies uh, with models that may be presented by the task force or others. A follow-up que follow question, <clears throat> because I want to make sure that we're we're getting right information in regards to the proper accounting. So, in your opinion, uh, as accountants and following through in in financial statements, in last year's health care bill, did Congress follow its due process in properly accounting for funds and cost analysis in a transparent and accurate accounting method? I don't see the ten-foot pole, but. <laughs> I, my understanding is that there will be a presentation of those people who prepared the financial statements for 2010 and who audited those financial statements, and that will be a presentation that they uh, believe is most appropriately addressed by them as opposed to us as standard setter. Is that a bailout? It is. <laughs> and uh, Dr. Coe, sorry, that's March 9th where we will have yeah. Treasury O and B uh, before us. I yield back the rest of my time. Thank you. And uh, before I yield to Mr. Cooper, um, is, is it uh, safe to say when we talk about getting more performance uh, information in the report and more easily understood um, that if you go to that web-based model and have more performance, one of the true intents of moving the CFR up into December is so that it can be used in drafting the subsequent year's budget. And that you know, in the current model, uh, it, it doesn't lend itself very well, especially the, the lack of performance and easily accessed performance information. Is that a fair statement? I think that's true. And, and I would simply point out that with the new GPRA Modernization Act, uh, at least for the high level, high priority goals, uh, the Congress uh, asked for quarterly reporting. So, in fact, you could begin to build up a more periodic reporting and have information not only at the end of the year, but during the year when there's some opportunity to make some course corrections or changes if you want to accelerate or decline the, the trend that, yep. that you're currently on. So uh, I think that's exactly right. Mr. Cooper. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let's be honest. This is one of the most important and most boring hearings in congressional history. <laughs> we are lucky if this is even on C-SPAN 3. There are about maybe 20 live people in this room, and half of them are asleep because <laughs> we are not speaking a language the average American voter understands. So let me put the cookies on a low shelf. And especially, I'd like to get Dr. Gosar's attention on this because, as a new member, perhaps he can rec rescue us. We are now sitting in a room of the only large enterprise left in America that is exempt from using real accrual accounting. This violates the first plank of the contract with America back in 1994-95. 
in which Congress was supposed to live by the laws it passes for the rest of the people. It is my understanding that every enterprise in this country with revenues of about $5 million has to use, in addition to cash accounting, also real accrual accounting. But somehow the Federal Government is exempt. We are hypocritical. Now, why is that? Well, first of all, I still can't find one lobbying enterprise in this town, and Lord knows there are thousands of them. There are between 30 and 60 lobbyists for every one of us. Not one of those folks, to my knowledge, is for real accrual accounting for the Federal Government. Isn't that interesting? When the average Civic Club member back home has to use real accrual accounting for their business, whether for profit or nonprofit, state and local governments have to use real accrual accounting. It prevents them from hiding their unfunded pension liabilities and things like that. So why isn't the Federal Government using it? This is a mystery that you gentlemen can help us solve, because while we are talking here about electronic display of information or fine-tuning these facts, there is not a lack of information. There is a willful blindness to that information. The rating agencies, Moody's and Standard & Poor's, have already said maybe we have one or two years left before we face a possible downgrade of the Treasury bond because we are so mismanaging our nation's finances. Now, how are we mismanaging it? According to cash accounting, our debt is on the order of $14 trillion. But if you look at our unfunded obligations, programs like Medicare, Social Security, things like that, it is more like unfunded obligations of 50, 60, who knows how many trillion dollars, many times larger. Our debt this year isn't a trillion five or so, it is more like two trillion. So when are we going to get real on these numbers? And that is why I think it is important to be somewhat blunt, be simple without being simplistic, to help the average American understand the situation we are in. Because it is very convenient here today for Federal officials to hide the real numbers. You are talking about electronic displays so that the average citizen. This, the Treasury Department has never held a press conference about the release of the financial report of the United States Government. Our own Treasury officials in both parties, whether it was the Bush administration or the Obama administration, they deliberately hide the release of this document, the only one compiled, according to law passed by Senator John Glenn, that uses the real numbers. So forgive me for being frustrated, but the business mantra is if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. We are refusing to measure the dimensions of our problem. A historian will look back at years hence and say they had the tools to do a good job, but they refused to use the tools. The tool is real accrual accounting because that enables us to see what is not only in the national checkbook, but what is on the national credit card. So I know Mr. Allen knows these issues cold. I appreciate his great service on FaceAB. I appreciate the other pioneers who have worked on this. But somehow we have to break the gridlock on this issue. Let us find one business lobby in America that is willing to support real accounting for the Federal Government. Where is the Chamber of Commerce? Where is the Business Roundtable? Where is the NFIB? For that matter, where is the Wall Street Journal? I have a chart in my office. I've had it for years. What's the debt? What's your share of the debt? We're using cash numbers. We need the real numbers. And you gentlemen can, while you're fa doing all the fancy fine tuning stuff, you can help us understand the plain, blunt truth. Uh, we're in a not using honest accounting standards, not using real accounting standards, not using accrual accounting standards for the Federal Government. So this is more of a statement than a question. I appreciate your efforts, Mr. Chairman, to highlight these issues, but I think it is important to make this a less boring hearing <laughs> and to put the cookies on a low shelf so that perhaps there is somebody out there in C-SPAN free land who will make this a cause and bring this to light. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. And uh, your statement is one of the reasons I'm delighted to be back on the committee with you and, uh, as I said, your efforts over many years to raise these very, very important issues and, as you say, uh, maybe boring but ever, ever important and uh, look forward to working with you as we go forward in these two years to uh, do a better job in having the American people truly understand the financial crisis facing us because, as you said, the real numbers are tens of trillions of dollars of, of unfunded uh, liabilities out there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Connolly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I want to um, uh, express to you my, uh, my delight in being on the subcommittee. I picked a third subcommittee because you were chairing it. 
So <laughs> thank you. Uh, I'm uh, honored. And, <laughs> and of course, you can imagine how thrilled I was that our first hearing was on accounting, because, you know, uh, a wonderful subject. But actually, uh, uh, first of all, Mr. Allen, you should know that I was uh, for a long time a consultant for FASB. And uh, I didn't lobby for FASB, but I helped represent FASB here in Washington, um, working with uh, other representatives of yours uh, in a consulting status, and uh, enjoyed very much working with FASB and going to Connecticut and debating green eye shade issues and <laughs> how they might be how how they might translate into public policy. Um, let me. Uh, I want to ask two questions. The first is, do you all ever look? though, at the cost of your decisions. Um, Mr. Allen, for example, I think, uh, I can't remember the exact number I used to know it by heart, but I was in local government for 14 years. And a new GASB standard added gazillions of dollars to the cost of local government, um, or eliminated even the option of expanding benefits because of the actuarial implications that GASB required us, all in the name of a new and more transparent accounting standard. And I think it depends on where you sit, how helpful that is. And my question is, do, does FASB and do others, and the other panelists could certainly feel free to comment, ever take into account the cost implications of your decisions, both on the federal and state and local government levels, or for that matter, in the private sector? Um, can I go ahead and start? Or, um, well, thank you. It's nice to see you. A, a welcoming face here and understanding the challenges of standard setting. I suspect I know what standard you're talking about that was passed. Uh, that was probably the last standard that I was involved in before I retired from GASB, and that probably had to do with recognizing the cost of health care promises right. for your employees. Was that GASB 76 or something like that? Yeah, yeah. 50, uh, right. 56, I think. Yeah, 50. Um, however, when one thinks about that, what has resulted from that decision? It, in other words, as accountants, we try to be non-political. We provide you information that you make decisions. In that particular case, that we receive letters back that were disconcerting. If you make us report this in our financial statements, they won't continue that benefit. And in fact, in the state of Utah, where I'm now a visiting professor at a university, I don't earn any benefit for health care because the state of Utah legislators, when faced with a decision of, do I put that on the face of my financial statements and recognize that, decided that that cost was too great for them to assume. So when you look at the role of accounting, it isn't to make decisions about what one should do, but it's to provide you clearly the information that you that you've got to make a decision understanding the full cost of that and i think that's what mr cooper was also addressing this issue if you put something on the face of the financial statement and recognize it would you make the same decision if that you would make if you don't have to put it on the face of the financial uh, statement mr. mr allen if i if i may uh, that, i'm not sure that's really true uh, when GASB came out with that standard, we didn't have a choice. The bond rating houses weren't going to accept our financial statements if we didn't do what you, in fact, set out for us. And as a result, it wasn't just a matter of make sure the public knows the transparency of the transaction. That meant that when I wanted to give on an annual basis, because everything's appropriated on an annual basis, that's not a, an applied commitment for tomorrow, uh, maybe I wanted to increase retirees' health care offsets because of the rise in health care costs. I couldn't just do that on an annual basis as we always had done before that GASB, uh, that new GASB standard. I now had to account for the actual life of each recipient forever. And that cost suddenly went from whatever it was, X, to 30 times X. Well, Mr. Cooper may think that's a good thing. But I can tell you as someone who spent 14 years managing a go county government that was selected as the best managed in the United States, we didn't think it was such a good thing. And it hurt our firefighters and our retirees because we could no longer provide that extra benefit uh, that they deserved and that they had earned. Um, and so um, my point is that it, this is a two-sided coin, that when you make certain standards, it has implications, and suddenly jettisons costs upward, even though nothing's changed, other than your 
accounting requirement. And, and I apologize to any effect that may have caused, you know, to individuals or to organizations. Nevertheless, the issue becomes not that GASB has any ability to make a government do anything like FASAB doesn't have any ability. The only question was, and many governments still provide that benefit and still don't fund health care. Most fund pensions. Many still don't fund that health care. But they do have on the financial statements the recognition of the obligation that is there under a concept called intergenerational equity. In state and local governments, that became the driving force that the cost of someone providing services ought to be recognized in the period that that service is provided, not recognized years later when somebody else paid the cost of those services. So that is the sometimes disconnect that happens between budgeting on a more cash basis and recognizing that cost on a more accrual basis. That is the challenge. Thank you. My time is up, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Connolly. Mrs. <laughs> Norton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, well, I, I wanted to, to be a member of the subcommittee because I have long had an, an interest in government efficiency. So <laughs> that is one of the things we are supposed to be dealing with and I hope these reports deal with. I ran a federal agency with a, with a very um, uh, serious underlying mission, but immediately uh, became uh, interested in the inefficiency of the uh, mechanisms because they weren't able to deliver the strong substantive mandate they had. Now, Mr. Kubert speaks about um, <laughs> making uh, what what you do and the CFR that's boring. Uh, anything with numbers alone is always boring. When I look at a graph, uh, I always read some text, even though a graph is pretty picturesque. I don't even know if you use graphs. Um, um, but the notion of, of making um, the work understandable to lay people could not be more important today because when we hear some <laughs> of what masquerades uh, in what I can only call propaganda for uh, for what is right or wrong with the government, you can understand that it must be that there is no objective, understandable information out there. I mean, some things uh, are a little bit easier to understand than others. For example. Uh, Social Security. Well, people still have to be told that the trust fund <laughs> will last X number of years, and that does give them some sense, some understand, a little bit of an understanding of Social Security, although it is kind of lumped together with everything else that needs cutting. It does need cutting, but the distinction is an important one. Uh, but, but if you take um, another program that I have always found uh, very, very difficult to understand, which is even more seriously <laughs> running out of money, Medicare. I don't think the average person for whom that means everything has any way uh, to fasten on uh, whether or not it will be, you know, you know if you are young whether or not Social Security <laughs> will be available. If it is not there, you know Medicare <laughs> certainly won't be there. <laughs> but what you don't know is Medicare is more seriously <laughs> running out of money uh, than Social Security. Uh, is. Now, you say, it, this is Mr. Allen's testimony, says on um, page 4, mentions a citizen's guide to, to <laughs> the financial report that began in 2007. And then at the bottom of the page, there's a task force necessary still um, to make recommendations on how to make this, um, th this uh, 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 more understandable and, and more accessible. What was there about the Citizen's Guide that I, t I take it caused the formation of the task force or would you reconcile the notion that there was a Citizen's Guide and what it did, right or wrong, uh, so that we understand why a task force um, of experts to increase user understanding, access, et cetera, was later formed? The, the, the Citizen's Guide was an excellent effort, not by a standard setter. It was by Treasury 
OMB and GAO getting together, as Mike indicated, and coming up with what they thought would be a better way to communicate. It has the same limitations uh, these two gentlemen have talked about, which is I can look at a summary total of something, but if I want to know any detail about that, I can't go down you know, to the details to better understand that. So that, that because you can't, because. Be, bec because I show one number. I may show the Depar see. Department of Defense. I see. That's, that's the number. Well, well, what if that isn't the number, what I want? I want to know some detail about that, and that's why this electronic delivery of information and, and how to organize the information. Again, back to Mr. Cooper's comment, uh, if you look at some of the illustrations, the 2004 illustration, for example, that came from the, the Treasury Department, it actually side by side and then combined, you know, the, the, the Social Security and, and other obligation, you know, information. And that was very pleasing to somebody and very, to some people and very disconcerting to others. But, but there has been an attempt to try and provide information that, that in these reports that help you understand better the financial statements, all the citizen guide comes from the financial statements. What they're talking about is giving additional information even beyond the summary information you see in the financial statements. I will say uh, just a couple things. Uh, one interesting thing is the citizen's guide is a, a paper-based document as well. Um, and Jonathan Brule made the point earlier, when we put, when the government puts, whether it be the CFR or other documents on, on a website, um, it's a static document. Uh, they essentially copy it, put a PDF up there, and you can read it, but you may as well be reading the hard copy. And what we're talking about is trying to get a, a, a document on there that you can go in and work with and drill down um, and look at this information, the information that you find uh, important to you and really understand that information. The Citizen's Guide to a 10, 12, 15 page summary of a 350, 400 page um, consolidated financial report. It's very helpful and I was part of the effort when I worked on this subcommittee uh, working with the folks at Treasury that came up with the Citizen's Guide model. Um, I, I thought that was a great, great first step. I think what we're suggesting here and as Tom points out, uh, from a standard setting standpoint is that we take it beyond that uh, to something that, that gets you better access to more information in a more understandable, usable fashion. And as I mentioned in my statement, uh, some of the recommendations really allow you to understand the true cost of government by function, not just necessarily by agency. And I think that is particularly important going forward as you look at the things that you're looking at. Thank you, Mr. Norton. Thank you. I'm going to have a second round and uh, I'll kick it off. And Mr. Allen, I'm going to go back to a little bit of your work with GASB and, and, and Chair and setting those um, accounting standards for state and local governments. Um, in addition to, uh, I think, as you referenced, uh, intergenerational equity, uh, are, are there lessons learned from your work at GASB with state and local government reporting that you, know, you think we can well apply to the federal government in, uh, in what we're doing? I guess the first two that come to mind are probably some that I have already mentioned. The, the challenge to, uh, as you know, state and local governments focus very much on short-term financial resources. And the, even the thought of adding these obligations to their financial statement was very disconcerting. And we sought feedback from the bond rating agency that basically said, what's important isn't what you report. We already know you have those things and we already add those up. What's important is that you clearly communicate where you're at and then present information that shows where you're going from there. And I actually think that's applicable to the federal government. I think people who have concerns about reporting stuff, the, the, the point isn't that we don't know there's obligations or not obligations out there. The point is, what are you doing about it as you go forward? I think that's very important. Uh, focus to look at. The other was very consistent with the report. We found that governments, state and local governments report, as Mr. Connolly would tell you, on a fund-by-fund -fund basis. Uh, people didn't want to know 
what was in a particular fund. They wanted to know what the cost of those services were and who paid that cost. So we had to change the whole operating statement to do that, and that will be one of the challenges of meeting the cost-based information that they're talking about. So yes, I, I think the we learned the information that people want about the federal government is very similar to what they wanted about state and local governments. Yep. Thank you, uh, Mr. Brule. The uh, ten recommendations of the task force. Uh, you, we're still looking at the budget release uh, this week. Uh, are you aware of any of those recommendations being incorporated into what's, uh, what's been put forth by the administration on this uh, the 2012 budget? Mr. Chairman, I'm not, but I, I would doubt very much uh, that there's a cost. In fact, we were hopeful some of these recommendations would, in fact, save costs by moving away from paper-based uh, printing and distribution. Um, and I don't think any of them really are costers. I think uh, they're they're pretty much cost neutral. And our recommendations were so recent, I would doubt very much that, that the OMB has had an opportunity to, to incorporate them in any of their thinking quite yet. Kay. In fact, they were made to the FASAB, and they'll get to OMB shortly when they, they come to the next FASAB meeting. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Towns? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Let's talk about how strong the government's financial statements are for a minute. Uh, I guess I'll start with you, Mr. Allen. Your organization sets accounting standards for the federal government. That's accurate, right? Yes. Isn't it true that every year there are government agencies with financial statements that cannot meet government standards? Yes, most of them do. There are I don't know this last year, but there's normally maybe three or four that don't, but most of the major agencies do meet those standards. And it, isn't it basically the same ones each time? That is my understanding, yes. Will any of the recommendations made here today help these agencies create more reliable financial statements? I, no. The, the, the issue is once you provide the information that's asked for, these recommendations will help how it, discuss how it ought to be more effectively communicated, how it can be more effectively accessed. But uh, I can tell you, for example, that one of those, as you well know, is the Department of Defense, and Defense accounting for you know, their assets. We have we have issued additional standards beyond that that says to do that and say, well, if you don't have the information, make estimations then. Do, do something to try and move forward. So we recognize that there's value in information. We don't want people to spend tons of time researching old costs. So we're, we're trying to be cost effective, but that agency still has to arrive at some point in time of having the information, and then you can talk about how better to communicate it. If an agency publishes, if an agency publishes unreliable financial statements on a central website, uh, uh, that can lead to all kinds of confusion. Uh, uh, you know, so what can we do to avoid that kind of uh, situation? The point is that once that gets out there, and if it's not correct, I mean, uh, that could create some serious problems. Well, I'm not sure the information is unreliable. It hasn't passed the audit standards, but I think it's just as important to have that disclosure as to what what we do know about that situation, and um, it might add a little shame and humiliation to the situation so that that might get people's attention to insist that they do adhere to the standards. So again, I think the, the idea of a little disclosure is helpful um, by making it known that that is the condition and that it's a condition that doesn't satisfy the auditors yet and that ought to upset the public, and that gives them an opportunity to insist that the matter be corrected. In closing, is there anything on this side that we need to do as members of Congress to make this work, these 10 recommendations and, and of course, anything we need to do? You want to address that, Mike, since you work with this committee, staff this committee? Uh, <laughs> I mean, I think, uh, obviously, drawing attention to the for me with the committee. <laughs> I think drawing attention to the issue as, as we're doing today is an, an important first step. Um, 
there's a lot. I mean, the, the the recommendations I think speak for themselves. But there are a lot of recommendations in there. These are recommendations that that we have made to FaceApp. Um, there's absolutely no reason that, a, as you look at legislation, as you conduct your oversight, um, that you, uh, I mean, you should look at these recommendations, and and some of them may be things that you all could could incorporate into into a legislative proposal. Um, some may not, and, and some would have to be tweaked to be incorporated into a legislative proposal. Um, but th certainly the transparency, um, the things that call for the centralized website and the, and the web-based uh, web reporting, uh, those are all things, quite honestly, that Congress could do uh, through legislation. A lot of that, I mean, USA spending, uh, all of those things have been, have been legislated. Uh, and so certainly you could do that. Um, I, I don't, um, beyond that, I don't, I mean, certainly we want to take a look at them. And, and there may be partial solutions to some issues, uh, full solutions to others, but I think you want to take a look at that. Um, and, and certainly those of us who are on the task force and, and, um, and others who've been involved in this, that process would be happy to help. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Connolly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, by the way, I would ask unanimous consent to enter my statement into the record. Without objection. I thank the chair. And I said I had two questions, so now I go to my second one. Um, we hear a lot about what uh, more transparent and accurate accounting could do uh, for the federal government. Uh, I wonder what your thoughts are about the critique that is sometimes raised that what we don't do very well, and you alluded to it, Mr. Brew, uh, with respect respect or maybe you Mr. Allen with respect to the Pentagon accounting for assets but in the public sector we're not always good at differentiating between consumption spending and investment which you do do in the private sector and um, and 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 we're not always good at accounting for what is an asset uh, especially in the public sector it's a little squishier sometimes than it is in the private sector uh, for, for good reasons um, you know, uh, but in any event, I, I, I would like your, your views on that. What if we, what, how do we get our arms around assets and spending that constitutes investments versus some other kinds of spending? One of the concerns I've got, and we've got the continuing resolution on the floor of the house right now is almost a mindless approach to spending. It's all bad and it's all the same. Well, it isn't the spending on the interstate highway system which was initiated by a Republican president, was, had a return on it that is impossible to calculate. It was so great. And aren't we glad we made that, sp that spending decision? Uh, yes, it costs money, but it's different than purchasing a bottle of water and consuming it. I wonder what your thoughts are on those two issues and how we can better account for them and how they would perhaps affect that picture. Well. Colin, I think your point is exactly the one that's addressed by this new GPRA Modernization Act, which is recognizing the need to marry the information about cost with information about what the results or performance is that you're buying for it. Is it just water you're consuming, or is it a long-term investment that's going to uh, accrue benefits over time? And having that kind of performance information visible alongside the cost, so you can make a judgment as to whether that dollar is more or better spent here rather than there. Um, and that's why one of the recommendations of this task force to inform those kind of decisions was to have performance information um, highlighted in the consolidated report as well. So the citizens would have uh, some more information about what they're getting for those dollars that are being spent. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, I'll just add uh, real quick, the, the property plant equipment, the asset issue is one that I'm sure as the, as the committee conducts its oversight and you begin to look at individual agency financial statements, you're gonna see a recurring theme. Uh, and part of that recurring theme is gonna be it's very difficult um, as part of the financial statement process to properly account for assets. And, and in particular, you're gonna see that problem, I think, uh, as it relates to, to places where they have um, huge assets like the Department of Defense, where you have aircraft carriers and ships uh, or NASA where you have satellites and things like that. Those are assets, uh, from my experience, and I'm not an auditor, uh, but I you know, did work on the, on the committee for four years. 
those are the things that as we looked at financial statements when I was on the committee, repeatedly uh, we heard concerns about. So when to, to go back to Mr. Townsend's question, as you're looking at these things um, and looking at agency financial statements, one of the things you probably ought to take a look at is, is, is there a way to better account uh, for assets for property, plant, and equipment in a way that it's not property, plant, and equipment that's drawing down um, the entire financial statement, but something that uh, that can be dealt with and uh, and allows those agencies to effectively manage their finances without having that uh, that pull it down. And I would just add that property, plant, and equipment is not the most important thing to account for in the federal government. Absolutely, I think, from my personal opinion, and everything I say obviously is my opinion, not FaceApp's opinion, but. From my personal opinion, the only thing that's important is, or the most important thing is to decide what are you going to do? Or should we expense all of these things, you know, when we buy them? Should we capitalize? What? And, and it almost doesn't matter. The, what matters is that you apply something, you make a decision, you apply it consistently going forward from that point. Then you can measure its impact on the rest of the operations of the financial government. Is this truly something that has long-term benefits that we want to capitalize and use up over the long term? If it isn't really significant, because the federal government is sure significant, maybe we'd be better off just expensing it uh, in the year that we make that uh, expenditure. And, and Mr. Chairman, I know my time is up, but I, I do think this is a very important aspect of what we're talking about, and I hope someday we can expand on it. I, I can just tell you in my own local government, uh, when I first uh, got elected, um, there was no ROI analysis on certain investments. Uh, so it was the clipboard method. Someone went around and said, okay, Jonathan, uh, what do you think you need this year for technology? Well, I think I need six computers. and Maybe I should have eight just because government being government, who knows when I'll get replacements. And there was no question of, well, but wait a minute. Uh, let's match your request against Mike's because he actually – can show ROI and we know he's productive and you need to compete with him for us to make that investment, you're going to have to justify it. Uh, uh, at the time, a completely alien concept. Today I'm proud to say we do it very rigorously and everybody understands they're going to have to justify that and other kinds of investments and that they're in competition with other agencies. And, and I'm just wondering, I mean, I, we haven't got time to do it, but I, I, it is my fervent hope that we can have a similar uh, appreciation in the federal government so that we're actually looking at return on investment when we make investments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I want to thank our witnesses again, and uh, both for your expertise that you've shared and your knowledge, but also your patience here with uh, hearing that because of the floor votes didn't start for about almost an hour and a half late. Um, and we look forward to continuing as a committee working with each of you individually and collectively as we go forward and, and helping set the stage today for our March 9th hearing when we do uh, shed some light on the consolidated financial report. And as Mr. Cooper said, um, there may not have been a press conference held when it was released, but we're going to do our best to make sure the American people know what it says and how important it is for them to know what it says because it's about their money. So uh, with that, we're going to keep the record open for two weeks. If there's any additional information to be shared, uh, along with written uh, statements from members, uh, again, thanks. And uh, this hearing stands adjourned. Adjourned. Thank you.